Hey guys, this is my full review, finally, of the Panasonic 7-14mm f4 ultra-wide zoom lens. Now, as you may know, this lens came out way back in 2009, so this review is going to address the question, is this lens still good enough in 2017? How does it do on the new Panasonic bodies like the G85 I'm shooting this with? Now, some of the new bodies have IBIS, which we're going to see how much does that help when you have an f4 lens. How good are the mechanics? How quiet is the autofocus? These are all questions you have when you're talking about a lens that was only the third lens ever released for the Micro Four Thirds system way back in 2009. I mean, now it's 2017. A lot of lenses have been updated. This one hasn't been updated. And spoiler alert, the reason why is this is still a kick-ass lens. Now let's get into it. Now, why would you want to use an ultra-wide lens? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Ultra-wide lenses tend to exaggerate the distance between your foreground object and your background object. So if you're taking a picture of somebody with something behind them with an ultra-wide lens, you'll be getting up in their face and it'll kind of stretch out that perspective. And the samples you see here kind of show, here's one shot taken at seven millimeters of this old telephone. And here's the same shot taken again at 14 millimeters. So you can really see what kind of exaggerations you can get with this lens. It's kind of fun to play around with like that. It can also be a great lens to have around when you can't really back up anymore. Like here I am on the Tibby Island Lighthouse in Savannah, Georgia on the narrow railing way up at the top by the light. Now, of course, I can't back up anymore. But because of this ultra-wide lens, I was able to get these dramatic ultra-wide shots of the light up on top. And then this shot, I was able to get the railing with a person on it looking off into the ocean. It's just a really fun lens to have around because it opens up a lot of possibilities that you cannot do with other lenses. And you can get that ultra-wide perspective without having to resort to a fisheye lens, which most of the time is not what you want. It's just kind of goofy. Now, I had an ultra-wide lens for my last system, a Pentax K5-2S, and I probably used it about five times. So I think a rectilinear lens is the way to go for my style of shooting. Another good use for an ultra-wide lens is when you're vlogging, because when you have a tight space, you can open it up and get some more room to move your arms around or show something off. You're not constrained so much. And I'm gonna have some samples later on in this video showing vlogging with this lens at 4K and vlogging with this lens at 1080p because on the G85 you have a little bit of a crop factor in 4K. 1080p it opens it up. Now if you're lucky enough to have a GH5 you don't have a crop factor in either mode so don't worry about that. Let's quickly touch on the build quality of this lens. You do get a metal mount but you do not have a weather sealing ring. This is not a weather sealed lens unfortunately. Of course you could say that when this lens came out in 2009 Panasonic did not have any weather sealed bodies to put it on so you can't really blame them too much for that. Now the rest of this lens is plastic. All of this, these finishes are all plastic and that's a change from the newer lenses that have some metal finishes on them like even this kit lens, this 12 to 60 has some metal here and up on the front and my 42.5 as well. So that's something that Panasonic has done on their newer lenses that you will not see here. But that being said, it's really good quality plastic. The lens has a good amount of heft to it. You can tell it's just packed full of glass. And looking at this lens diagram, you can see it has some ED elements, some aspheric elements. It's really a complex optical design. And that's what's really required on these ultra wide lenses. They're not easy lenses to make and they're expensive. I paid just a little bit under 700 for this lens buying it off of eBay. If you buy it off B&H or Adorama, you're going to be paying closer to 800 And of course, if you buy it off Amazon, you'll be paying 800 plus tax. So you get a very smooth zoom action. It's pretty tight, but it's smooth. You're able to turn it without too much jerkiness. And the same thing goes for the manual focus ring, which is fly by wire, of course. And when you zoom, the front element moves ever so slightly in and out. So the nice thing about that is the lens itself is not changing length. It's all happening behind this integral pedal hood. So to sum up, yeah, you're getting older aesthetics. You're getting the older font, some older design elements like this gray ring up here. But it still looks like a modern lens. It still looks good on the G85. I wouldn't 
really consider that a deal breaker in any sense. All right, now that I've touched on the build quality, I'm gonna put this lens on the camera and do the remainder of this review shooting with the 714. Quite a difference. Now let's get into still image quality. I'm gonna show you two samples now. Now this shot was taken at seven millimeters F4. Here's a center crop. And here's a corner crop. Now here's the same shot again at 14 millimeters. And the center crop and a corner crop. Now these shots were both taken wide open at f4 and even then you're getting really good performance. The corners get a little bit sharper towards f5, f5.6, but beyond that you're going to get a softer image due to diffraction. So I would say this lens gives a really nice uniform performance from wide open through about f8 or so. So I'd say that plays into one of the strengths of this lens. Even though it's an f4 aperture, it's a fixed f4 aperture. So when you're doing video and you're zooming, you're not getting any exposure change. And even though it's f4, you can shoot it confidently at f4 to get really good cross frame sharpness. And on the newer Panasonic cameras, IBIS gives you a leg up. You can shoot low light down to maybe a quarter of a second, maybe even a half of a second with this lens. So I'd say unless you're doing astrophotography or just really low light shooting, I wouldn't worry too much about the fact that this is an F4 lens. If you have IBIS, it really helps get those slower shutter speeds. Now there are some image quality issues that are pretty common for ultra wide lenses. This shot, take a look at this flare going across diagonally from the top. That's pretty bad and the fact that because it's an ultra wide lens, you cannot use your hand to shade it because your hand will end up in the shot. Now, like I said, this is pretty common for ultra wide lenses. It's not something that's especially bad on this lens. It's just something to be aware of and try to do your shooting around it. Try to watch where that sun is and make sure it's not showing up too bad in your shots. Now I'm using this lens in a Panasonic G85, but if you have an Olympus camera, there's another Olympus specific image quality issue you have to watch out for. For some reason, I'm not exactly sure if it's a software correction issue or maybe some kind of uh, sensor infrared filter strength or particular wavelength issue. Some people have suspected that. You get these purple flare blobs on Olympus cameras under very specific internal flare conditions with this lens. Now I cannot personally comment on this because I don't have an Olympus camera, but from what I've read, it's something that shows up pretty rarely, but when it does, your shot is pretty much ruined. So as these samples show, it, it's pretty bad. And if you do have an Olympus camera, it's just something to keep in mind. There are Olympus lenses that will not do this. Um, so make sure you consider those before buying this lens. Now another area where this lens really comes alive is video. And on the Panasonic G85, you get a slight crop factor when you're shooting 4K. It's less of a crop factor than you get with the GH4, but the GH5 has no crop factor whatsoever in 4K. So I'm gonna show you a sample now of walking and shooting 4K. And here's a sample walking and shooting 1080p. And you can tell in this shot you're getting just a little bit of extra dramatic wide feel that you don't quite get when you're shooting 4K. But it's not a huge difference. Okay, so here I am in 4K. This is the field of view I get with 7 millimeters. And this is 1080p and you can tell there is a difference here. It can really stretch out just a little bit more than I could in 4K. And now let's discuss the elephant in the room on this lens, and that's the fact that it cannot take screw-on filters. Now, I noticed something interesting when I lined up some other lenses from other systems. There seems to be a threshold right at 15 millimeters full frame equivalent, where anything wider than that could not take a screw-on filter, no matter which system you're in. You look at lenses like the Nikon 14-24, the Canon 11-24, and they have that same bulbous front element. But then you look at lenses like the Leoa 7.5 for Micro Four Thirds, the Fuji 10 to 24 for APS-C. Those are both 15 millimeter equivalent at the wide end and they can take screw on filters. So what this tells me is that's basically just a universal design constraint of that focal length. It's, it's a trade-off. If you're gonna go that wide, 
you're going to have to either rig up something to mount filters in front of your lens. I've seen people put these kind of slide box things on the front to do that. Some of these lenses let you put filters in the back. This one does not. So that's just a trade-off you seem to get when you have a lens that's 14 millimeter equivalent on the wide end. Because of that 15 millimeter threshold, you're not going to be able to mount a screw-on filter to this lens. Now, if you shoot Panasonic or Olympus and you want an ultra-wide with a screw-on filter, there's two other options that I'm aware of. The problem is neither one are available right now. There's the Leoa 7.5mm f2, that's a small manual focus prime that can take filters because 7.5 times 2 for micro four thirds crop factor is 15 and it's designed to allow for that. And the other lens is the announced but not yet available Panasonic Leica 8 to 18mm f2.8 to f4. Now let me go ahead and zoom this lens from 7 to 8 to show you the difference you would get with that lens. It's pretty small, but it is there. And if I zoom back to, to uh, seven, so what you just saw there is your trade-off for mounting a filter. Now this upcoming Panasonic Leica lens is bound to be pretty expensive. My estimate is probably $12.99. That puts it at almost double the cost of this lens. Now it will have weather sealing, it will have metal finishing on the lens. It's gonna be a much more modern lens um, in terms of mechanics and feel but it's going to cost a pretty penny and it's not going to be quite as wide either. All right, so to wrap up, the lens is small and light. It's sharp even at f4. You do get fast and quiet autofocus and the build quality is pretty solid. Now for cons, it's not weather sealed. Like I said, that's just a consequence of it being such an old lens. It didn't have any weather sealed bodies at the time when this lens was announced. It does not have filter threads, but that's more of a consequence of having that 14 millimeter equivalent wide end. And if you have an Olympus camera, you have some purple flare blobs you have to watch out for. And to conclude, it's a sharp and compact ultra-wide zoom. It's a superb lens. Just be aware of its limitations. Know about your other options. If you want a lens that's ultra-wide, flexible from a walking around perspective, and you don't really mind the fact that it can't take filters, this is a great way to go. All right, guys, I hope you enjoy that. I'm just going to end with some samples here. Uh, stay tuned because now that I have this, the fifth and final lens for my five lens kit, I'm going to update that review and get that up shortly. All right, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe.